Okay, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Depends on where you are. Thank you all for joining us today at uh, this webinar hosted by International Institute for Sustainable Development. ISD is an independent think tank championing sustainable solutions to 21st century problems. Our mission is to promote human development and environmental sustainability. Through research, analysis, and knowledge sharing, we identify and champion sustainable solutions that make a difference. We report on international negotiations, conduct rigorous research, and engage citizens, businesses, and policymakers on the shared goal of developing sustainability. In today's webinar, together with our research partners, we would like to share some of our recent studies in the area of financing for soil remediation. Soil contamination is an urgent problem around the world. According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, this is the third largest threat to soil function. This environmental problem also poses serious societal challenges, such as food insecurity and public health threats. However, like many other SDG challenges facing us today, significant amount of financing is needed to address the soil contamination problems. Take China as an example. Estimates suggest that nearly 20% of farmland is contaminated in China, with total remediation costs at about 1.3 trillion US dollars in the next five years. On the other hand, it is expected that only about 15% of those funds will be available from public sources. The rest will have to be raised from private sources, leveraging capital markets or through public-private partnerships. This is why we are working on financing models for soil remediation in China, while hoping our study at the same time can also contribute to and shed some lights to similar problems other countries are facing. Our project is supported by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign <coughs> Affairs. All research works are carried out together with our Chinese and international partners. In China, we have the pleasure to work with the Chinese Academy of Environmental Planning, HIEP, under the Ministry of e Ecology and Environment, and with the International Institute of Green Finance of the China Central University of Finance and Economics. Globally, we have the insights from Norwegian Institute for Water Research and Center for International Climate and Environmental Research. This is a four-year project started in 2017. While at today's webinar, we'll share some of our preliminary fund findings at this stage, and we're glad to have experts joining us from our partner institutions. We'll look at some recent developments in China regarding its efforts in addressing soil contamination problems. We will also look at international experiences in terms of financing for soil remediation, as well as innovative financing tools and measures that could be utilized in soil remediation projects. Before we start, for participants on this call who are unfamiliar with this platform, you will see at the bottom of your screen are two buttons, one called raise hand, the other one called chat. If you'd like to raise any questions or to communicate directly with hosts or panelists, please feel free to use those two functions by clicking those buttons at any time during this webinar. So our first speaker is from the Chinese Academy of Environmental Planning. Founded in 2001, CAIEP is a public institution under direct supervision of Ministry of Ecology and Environment of China. Over the years, CAIEP has provided a great deal of scientific and technical support for Chinese governmental authorities to aid their decision making. One of the most recent examples is the Soil Pollution Prevention and Control Law which was just adopted by top Chinese legislatures two weeks ago. Colleagues from CAIEP has contributed tremendously in the initial draft of this law. Our first speaker, Zilin Yuan, is a research assistant in Chinese Academy for Environmental Planning. 
He graduated from Southeast University in Nanjing, China, and obtained his master's degree from Carnegie Mellon University in the United States. And after that, he continued as a visiting scholar in CMU, focusing on environmental nanotechnology. After that, he joined CHIUP, and his research interests include environmental economic policy, environmental planning and management, and environmental engineering. So now the floor is yours, Celine. Hello, hello everyone. So firstly, thank you for George's introduction. And it's my great honor to be here to give a presentation to so many experts and audience online. So in the next 15 minutes, I will try to answer the following questions. First, why the soil remediation is so important in China? Second, what is the co content of the new, new soil pollution control and permutation law in China? Third, why the financing waste is so important for soil remediation in China? And fourth, what is the financing pattern we use in soil remediation in China? So in past 40 years, we expect Experiencing a rapidly industrialization and urbanization uh, process. This process is great, but it also bring our uh, bring a new challenge for, to soil pollution controls in our countries. From this picture, you can see that the red and the green dots are the pollution sources in China. It spread all over the China. They discharge a large amount of the pollutants to our environment, and a large part of them. Uh, directly and indirectly uh, get into our soil. Uh, next. Next. Uh, in, the, in, in the meantime, we experiencing, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, uh, we experiencing a uh, urbanization process uh, in our countries. In this picture, you can see that ur urban population is uh, constantly grows in the past 60 years and exceeds the rural areas in about uh, 2015. And this growing means that there, there will be a large amount of the people moving from the rural area to the urban areas, which is also the lot of factories lo located. Uh, next. The city, the city will growing bigger and bigger. That means uh, the factories have to shut down and to relocate it. And the, they, they will left a lot of polluted land uh, in our countries. And these lands are more, uh, these polluted land are more accessible to the people and cause them, uh, cause the health risk problems. Next. Next, yeah, this one. Uh, in 2015, and almost 15, stu uh, 500 students in Changzhou, they, were, uh, they get sick, uh, they get sick after they take class in schools, which only, uh, open for six, ma six months, and after investigation, it turned out it's caused by the soil pollution. Next. On the other hand, the soil pollution problem also endanger our food securities. Uh, it is estimated 20 million tons of the grains are polluted by heavy metals, and the direct uh, economic loss exceeds $3 billion each year. Next. So the soil remediation is a really big issues in China and we have to admit that we didn't uh, do a very good job at the very early stage. And now people are desire to change and the government are working on that issues and to, to make the problem, problem solve. Uh, from this slide, you can see that in recent 10 years, the environmental policies, uh, the government published uh, for the remediation, uh, for the soil remediation problems. And next. However, we never have the, even we have so many policies uh, under regulations, we actually don't have a real laws for the soil pollution control and permutations. That's make a lot of abstract for our soil remediation project in China. And finally, we pass a, the state People's Congress pass a first soil pollution and pollution control and permutation laws in this year's August 
uh, 31. And this, this law has the seven chapters and uh, 99 clauses. And from in, in the chapter one, this is the general principles. It's, uh, it's, it's defined the goal of this, this laws and the principles for we, we use in soil pollution controls and the obligation of the governments and the Chinese citizens in soil pollution control. And the, in the chapter two, it's planning standards and the survey and the monitors. And in these chapters, so this law says the governments above county level should have the soil pollution controls and permutation part in their plannings. And the central government should should make the standards for soil pollution and permutation standard system and uh, should investigate the soil pollution situation all over China every 10 years. And the so chapter three is the uh, permutation and protections. In these chapters, they list uh, many circumstances you need to implement the soil permutation and uh, control measurements. And the chapter four is the uh, risk management and uh, uh, remediations. There's a three section in these chapters. The chapter section one is a general rule, general rules. And it, it's, it lists the general rules for the soil risk management and the remediations. The, sec uh, the, uh, chapter, uh, the section two is a uh, farmland risk management and the remediations. We divided our farmlands into three classes. The first class is, is pair protection classes. And the second class is, is a safe utilization classes. The third class is, is a strict control classes. For different classes, we have to adopt different management methods. And it's all defined in these laws. And the third section is construction land. And we define the, the risk management method for the construction land in our countries. And the uh, chapter five is the uh, supporting and the supervisions. And it lists, uh, in this chapter says the government should support the soil remediation through many ways, including the financial, uh, publish the financial, po financial policies. In chapter six, it's the uh, legal liabilities. It lists many levels of punishment if you break these laws. And in chapter seven, it's a supplementary article articles. It, it says this law implemented on 2019, January 1st. Uh, next, next slide. This law is very important because with this law, the soil remediation policy system in China will be systematic and this law will be the guidelines for every policies, every soil remediation policies in China in, in the future. So, and this law is also provide a legal guarantee for soil pollution controls in China. So this law is a really, really big one in soil market in China. And next slide. And as a research institute helps the government to make the decision, we also make our contribution to, to these laws. We wrote two references to the Ministry of Ecology and uh, Environment. Next. We, we, we suggest that we should set up the National Soil Pollution Control Fund, like the super fund uh, in US. It's, it's kind of this bond and next. And if you look at the articles uh, 71 and 72 in this law, you can find them, they actually adopt these suggestions. In article 71, uh, besides the states promote the in investment in soil pollution prevention and uh, controls and set up soil pollution control funding system. Next. And the reason we, write, uh, we wrote these two references is that we think we can't achieve the goal that clean up our soils without the financial funding policies. 
And so we summarize some of our idea into this report. It, you can download it online and next. In this uh, 53 pages report, we introduced the current situation of soil pollution in China and soil remediation financing policies in China. And in chapter two, we introduce soil remediation patterns we use in China. There are seven patterns uh, in these chapters and each sec section, each patterns, we introduce the successful project using these patterns and the advantage of these patterns and the change of these patterns. Uh, in practice in China. And at the end of this report, we list the problem of the soil remediation financing system in China. And we list some suggestions for the futures, what we can improve. Uh, next. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the soil pollution is really serious in China. And you can see this from the pictures for many, for different types of land we have a pretty high unattainment rate in, of the soil contaminant seed. And next. And this problem leads to a pretty huge soil remediation market. And there's more and more companies getting to these areas and the governments put more and more money into, the, uh, into this, uh, these areas. So it's, it's a still growing and uh, very promising market in China. Next. But there are also a lot of challenge for this market. Firstly, although the government put a lot of, uh, put more and more investment into this area, there's still a big gap between the fund we have and the fund we need in the futures. And secondly, uh, the, the, the main body's responsibility for soil pollution in China is pretty hard to defined, partly because uh, our, our public land ownership. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it's hard to read all fundings simply, simply based on the principle of the Pluter, Pluter pains. And it's limited, limited our financing channels. And thirdly, compared to the developed countries, our remediation technologies and uh, experience is lag about 40 and to 50 years. That's a big obstacle for us. And next. But this obstacle won't stop our steps. Actually, in recent years, we already explore many financing patterns in China. And there's uh, six financing patterns uh, mainly used in China's soil remediation system, uh, market. And they're all fully introduced in our report and next. And in, in the end of this report, we also make uh, some suggestions for the future soil remediation financing policy in China. And firstly, we think we should promote the establishment of the financing mechanism. And second, we should form a diversified in investment structures. Third, we should explore our financing products. And uh, finally, we, I think we should improve the government's basic serving capacities. And this is my uh, introduction. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Jelaine, for um, giving us this um, general, general background on China's efforts in combating soil pollution and also the snapshots of how these projects are being financed in China, the seven models that uh, he mentioned. Um, next, we'll invite Ingrid Skumlan Fruset, our next speaker from NEVA. Norwegian Institute for Water Research to share some experience from other parts of the world. The Norwegian Institute for Water Research, NIVA, is a world-leading institute for fundamental and applied research on pollution removal and environmental restoration. Our next speaker in Grilled is an environmental economist 
currently employed at EVA, Section for Water and Society. In her position, she works on a range of different research projects related to financial mechanisms and policy instruments as means to reduce negative effects on the environment. Ingrid has previously carried out a study assessing environmental fee as measured to reduce negative environmental effects in aquaculture industry. She is the lead author of Neva's report on international examples of green financing approaches to soil remediation. Ingrid has also, a strong, also has a strong interest in business ethics through corporate social responsibility approaches. So next please, Ingrid. Hi everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar. This is Ingrid from NIVA, and I will present some of the findings from our report. Um, our report is centered around these case studies from throughout the world, exemplifying approaches to soil remediation. Every case gives some important lessons, uh, and to learn even more, check out the report. And next. We use this framework to visualize uh, each case, and this is the Superfund case. Um, in each case, we looked at the background of the remediation project, identified financial actors, instruments, sources, and recipients, and assessed the cost and risks. I will soon uh, describe two of the cases, but first, some important notes. Next. First, many types of financing models are being utilized for remediation projects. Among others, grants, debt, bonds, credit enhancement, tax incentives, as well as public-private partnerships and crowdfunding. Legislation is very important. Many countries follow the polluter pays principle, which is also the case for China with this new law. Although in principle, the polluter shall pay, in many cases, it is not feasible because of difficulties in identifying the polluters or the polluter simply does not exist anymore, among other reasons. Therefore, it is a need for other financing approaches to soil remediation. Next. This is uh, the first case. It's the Danish Oil Industries Remediation Fund which funded the remediation of former petrol stations and later also private oil tanks for <laughs> heating purposes. The energy crisis in the early 70s led to almost 8,000 closed petrol stations uh, in Denmark. Environmental assessments revealed the need to clean up soil beneath these petrol stations. Enforcement of the polluter pays principle were complicated because of changes in company structures. The situation had potential to lead to lengthy and numerous legal processes. The Danish oil industry realized the situation and proposed a voluntary scheme leaning on close collaboration with government and funding from a sales fee on petrol. The scheme had clear criteria for funding, which made it easier to decide which sites to be prioritized, while the sales fee ensured continuity of funding. Throughout 23 years, the fund succeeded in funding all sites eligible for funding. This case was special because it directly diffused the cost to a large group without trying to hold a specific site owner or operator directly liable for the cost. The major advantage was that they could avoid litigation almost entirely. It was feasible as all sites were contaminated with substances previously sold by the oil industry and they avoided distortion of competition as all uh, oil companies operating in Denmark were in on the agreement. Next. The second case is the Ginkgo Fund 1 which funded remediation of seven uh, contaminated sites in France and Belgium. They aimed to capitalize on the scarcity of land in attractive locations and the existence of large number of well-located brownfields. Revenue streams were secured by selling their reposition properties to third parties at a premium. Inco aimed to work closely with local governments, for instance, 
through uh, public-private partnerships and we develop the sites conforming to official urban development plans. The professional management of the plan led to accumulation uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yes, they aim to redevelop the sites conforming to official urban development plans. The professional management of the fund led to accumulation of competence and efficiency in which each project could benefit from. The Ginkgo Fund 1 is an example where the trust and quality of the investment by public institutional investors seems to enhance the mobilization of private capital. On the downside, huge amount of financial capital were needed by institutional investors to create that trust. The method can only be applied in attractive areas on sites that do not need extraordinary remediation efforts in order to be profitable. The success of Ginkgo Fund 1 led the team to raise money for a second Ginkgo Fund following the same model. Next. Yes, uh, the previous one. <laughs> so what could we learn from this? International experience shows that the choice of a suitable financing approach can give good value for money and also attract private capital. Different remediation cases require different types of financing models. We found that the potential value of land is important for selecting financing models. Consequently, the location and end use are key. Also, the required remediation effort will be decisive for development of profitable projects. It might be easier to mobilize private funding in urban areas as remediation allow for further development. In this case, debt, credit announcement, tax incentives, and equity investment could be applied. Some remediation projects do not offer any clear commercial opportunities and will not necessarily result in any revenue streams after restoration. These projects therefore require more public funding and philanthropic contributions. Both public-private partnerships and crowdfunding may be effective financing avenues in these circumstances. In sum, there is no uniform approach and actors and institutions are recommended to apply a financing mechanism that is the best fit for purpose for the planned remediation project taking into account case-specific circumstances, including socioeconomic context, income potential, complexity of pollution, and time frame. In addition, our work found that the most successful examples of remediation funds had a stable revenue streams. There are examples on remediation funds where government support ceased. As a result, a large number of contaminated sites still need to be remediated. For that reason, it is important to ensure continuity in funding when forming a fund. Continuity may be ensured by tax on polluting industries, regular grants from general fiscal revenue, or through revolving loan funds, amongst others. Um, next. I wish to express our gratitude for everyone who contributed to this report and to our listeners. Thank you for your time. And if you want to learn more, please uh, check out the reports. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid, for, for giving us this thorough introduction of um, experience some of the experience that uh, you learned from those case studies around the world, and definitely um, these are these are um, very um, helpful examples that um, other countries can learn as well uh, from their success, um, as well as some of the challenges that these projects faced. So next, I'll um, I'll invite um, uh, our own colleague Oshani Pereira is the Director of Public Procurement in Infrastructure Finance Program of ISD um, to, to introduce to us 
some of the work that she did in this area in terms of what are um, other innovative grain financing instruments that are available uh, that available in other projects but can also be applied in soil remediation projects. So Oshani advises governments on small public procurement, public-private partnerships, and infrastructure financing strategies to optimize value for money at the point of commissioning and across the asset lifestyle. In the public procurement of goods and services, Oshani focuses on design of policies, technical specifications, award criteria, and contract conditions that embedded environmental and social performance. In the commissioning of infrastructure, she focuses on the structuring of project preparation and of PPPs. Developing robust feasibility analysis, optimizing risk allocation, improving predictability of demand and revenue, channeling capital towards green and sustainable public assets. Ashani, please. Thank you, Joe, and uh, thank you so much. Now, in this report, uh, in the three, series of three, we look at how different sectors in the sustainability debate have been approaching the innovative financing challenge. And we describe some of these examples, and then we discuss their relevance and how they could be used to finance the remediation of contaminated soil. So I'm going to build upon what the previous speakers, Azilin and in Ingrid, talked about, and I'm going to bring it more into the innovation space. Now, might I remind us all that it's a previous slide, actually. I think we skipped one slide. It may have the previous slide. Um, might I remind us all that what innovation is all about is we're looking to bring in alternative sources of financing into a field, and in this case, it's the remediation of soil. So we're looking to in attract private capital, and in attracting private capital, we are seeking to bring in capital holders that do not typically get involved in financing sustainable development and in financing the remediation of soil. Next slide. The baselines for the financing is, of course, the risk-based approach that was discussed by the former speakers. Can the polluter be identified? Zilin talked to, to us about the challenges there in China. If the polluter can be identified, can the polluter actually be held liable? Very important when we try to think about how to finance the remediation. Can the polluter be held liable? Then the next challenge that arises is what are we going to use the remediated land for and there we come across challenges on the fitness for purpose ingrid talked about that five minutes ago and then in looking at the fitness for purpose what are the characteristics and what are the costs of the remediation all these risks have to be identified and have to be ring-fenced. We need to understand the interconnections between the risks as we structure finance. And finally, we talk about the value capture. Very, very important because investors are after a return and the return is linked to the risk. Higher the risk, higher the return. So, they're asking us, will the price of land increase after remediation is complete? The answer is sometimes not obvious. And if the price of land will increase, you're asking, will it generate a return? Will it bring revenues? How stable are these revenues? And how long-term are these re revenues? 
So let us just dwell for an example on the case of urban land. In the case of urban land, if after cleanup the land can be used to build houses, build offices, build commercial areas, build parks, etc., then yes, the land of the value will increase, the real estate value might be significant, the real estate value might be expected to increase into the next 10, 15 years. And then in such cases, there is a strong revenue stream and lots of investors might be interested to look at financing different stages of the remediation and redevelopment. In the case of agricultural land, there might be certainly a revenue stream after the land is cleaned up. But that revenue stream might not be so obvious or so predictable as in the case of real estate and urban areas. So then, yes, investors might be interested to go into that a project and finance the remediation of agricultural land, but it would need much more solid underwriting by the government. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. So, when there is reasonable certainty on the sources of pollution and the costs of the remediation, investors are happy. When land value will increase after remediation is complete, and we have certainty on that, then both governments and investors are very happy. And when the post-remediation activities will bring the predictable and stable financial returns, then governments, public landowners, and private investors will find it worthwhile to have a conversation on how that project can be financially planned. Therefore, our report works from that point onwards. We look at 17 case studies from a range of sectors, from banking to conservation finance and infrastructure. And we look at how these projects have been financially structured, how they came about, and how public money has been used as a basis for giving comfort to private capital holders and bringing them into the deal. From then on, we try to explore, in the case of soil remediation, how could such an instrument be envisaged, designed, and applied? And then we look at a range of instruments. Um, they, the range is shown on this slide and it goes from viability gap funds that not many people have heard about to bonds that people have heard a lot about from debt for nature swaps that people in conservation finance have been debating on for the last 30 years to insurance and you might be wondering oh you know isn't that an instrument we already know about now, the gift, if I might put it that way, the gift in these case studies might be not so much in the instrument, but in how the instrument has been designed in an innovative manner. Tax emit, let's take one example, tax incremental finance and the case of Alberta, that is, in one of the case studies we've looked at. Now the gift in this is how property taxes of the future have been rendered stable and predictable enough to fund land remediation today. If you take the example of bonds, we have several bonds, several different types of bonds uh, included in this report. And 
Particularly interesting here might be how the World Bank used a capital market index linked to the sustainability performance of companies to raise money for development financing. And to help us follow the complexity of these financial innovations, we've included little flow diagrams like what you're looking at now. So it enables the reader and it enables our eyes to follow the financing thread in a, a little bit more lucive and easier manner because the complexity of these instruments are something that we have to learn to grapple with as we look at financing. Um, financing is never easy. And I would like to leave you with um, uh, a few uh, parting thoughts that is actually reiterating what I said before. Financing is never easy and the money follows the well-prepared project and the well-prepared project rests very much on to what extent do we know the risks involved in the remediation project. If we, the more we know and we understand the risks, the easier it is for us to plan the financing. As we move into the future and we are increasingly faced with the challenge that governments have less and less money and all governments around the world are very preoccupied with budget deficits and ways of saving money, we need to position public capital as seed capital or as underwriting and use that as a basis where we can bring in other capital holders from the private sector and also from the public sector to finance remediation. That is where innovation kicks in. And then needless to say, innovation is more possible when we have predictability into the revenue streams after remediation. And in the cases when there is no predictability on the revenue streams and when the revenue streams are weak, we need a bit more innovation in how public finance can be used as a guarantee to de-risk into the future, to de-risk the lack of revenue streams into the future and lend comfort to certain types of private investors that are better placed to finance the remediation of soil, which is growing in importance. The law in China is just the tip of the iceberg. This is going to em emerge in, in the next years as one of the most challenging issues of our times. And for once, might we be ready with financing strategies ahead rather than uh, affect a complete uh, thank you for the opportunity, Joe. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashani, for this introduction of um, and, and making the uh, uh, pointing out to the importance of what is really important is the innovative design of the financing instruments and how to ensure um, the reasonable certainty on both of the total cost as well as the future revenues of um, the soil remediation projects. Um, so, um, next, I would like to invite another of our partner, Matthias Lawson, who is the Director of International Cooperation and also Research Fellow at the International Institute of Green Finance of Central University of Finance and Economics of China, to comment, to make a short commentary um, and uh, uh, after the, the three speakers just share their thoughts. Um, so that will also give our participants, listeners, some time to form up their own questions, if they have any, um, to, to post those questions to our panelists. Um, so just a quick introduction on Matthias. 
He is, um, well, first introduction of the IIGF, the International Institute of Green Finance. This is the first international research institute in China whose goal is to promote the development of green finance. And Matthias, um, the director of international cooperation in IIGF, specialized in the role of private sector in sustainable development. He has worked for UN Habitat in Nairobi, Kenya, and also UN Global Compact in New York, United States. His research focuses on relations between Chinese and international green finance, including winning bonds, climate finance flows, and multilateral development bank cooperation. So Matthias, over to you. Thank you, Joe, for the uh, introduction. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to give a few comments on these uh, presentations we've heard. Um, so as you mentioned, the International Institute of Green Finance, where, where I work, is a, is a think tank. So we specialize specifically on green finance. That means that we take a purely financial perspective on these things. So what we've contributed to in this research is on green finance. So the comments I'd like to give today are also centered around this. Specifically, I'll spend just a few minutes to talk about the green finance approach we take in, in, the, in the reports across the three of them, and then put this into the latest developments in green finance in, in China. So a few words on the approach we take in the, in the report and how we conceptualize the whole idea of green financing solutions is that the approach has to be both comprehensive and exhaustive simply with the intention to include all possible solutions to be covered in the cases. And then it also has to be clear um, and very thoroughly conceptualized so that we can compare the cases between the reports and between different uh, geographic locations. So for example, when we look at these aspects, we then have the sources, the actors, the instruments, recipients, and motives. And when we conceptualize this by the same sub parts of these, it makes it a lot easier to compare uh, between the, the cases. So in sources, we have four different subcategories. In actors, we have seven subcategories, the same for instruments and so on. So when this is conceptualized, then we have a thorough approach, very fundamentally. Um, so when we then look at the cases in the three reports that cover different geographic regions, we can compare the lessons more directly. This then means that lessons can better be learned uh, between the cases, ultimately meaning that China can better use these lessons from previous cases and better design the green financing models for soil remediation in China in the future. So this takes away some of the issues understanding complex financing models by separating these aspects of financial, financial solutions from each other. So this should then make it easier for non-financial experts uh, in the audience to understand these cases. This is at least the intention. If it's not the case, then of course we're happy to, to provide further input and take questions at, at a later stage. So second, just to put this into the latest development of green finance uh, in China. Um, Right now, the NDRC, what's equivalent to a Ministry of, uh, of, of Economics in China, is developing a new green industry catalog, which is part of this uh, harmonization efforts of what is green uh, outside and inside the financial system in China. And so remediation will be included in this green catalog. Once the catalog is out, presumably, it could be out already by the end of, of the month. If not, then soon after that. Uh, all green finance standards will be harmonized on the basis of this new catalog by the NDRC, meaning that soil remediation will be eligible for all types of uh, green finance support um, across the loans, bonds, PPPs, funds, and so on. So how will it be listed in this green finance industry catalog and for green finance tools is as a pollution prevention and control measure under specifically environmental rest restoration projects. They phrase it in something like integrated improvement of urban polluted water, and mine land reclamation and ecological restoration, remediation and soil pollution. So this is very specifically uh, included in this new catalog that will come out. And just to reiterate that, this will then mean that soil remediation will be eligible for all green finance product support. So this is a uh, this will simply make the financing easier because it can be defined uh, in terms of, of green finance as a more coherent project. 
So at a, at a local level, things are also uh, developing quite rapidly. We see more and more incentive mechanisms for soil mediation and other things. This means that there can be a subsidy on interest rates. There can be project preparation facilities. Um, local governments can cover transaction costs um, for issuing green bonds and so on. So these are things that are happening locally as well. Uh, so in general, green finance, the environment of this in China is becoming more and more supportive of soil remediation projects. So these are basically my two comments. I'm of course happy to take questions now and I'm also available uh, at a later stage. Feel free to, to reach out to me. So, so thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for this, these um, insightful comments. Um, now I would like to open the floor for participants to join us for, for Q&A session. Um, again, as mentioned earlier, to, um, to, to pose your questions, there are two ways of posing your questions. Um, first of all, you can just use the chat button there, typing your question. So the host um, will be able to see those questions and forward it to the panelists. Um, otherwise, if you would like to speak out, you can click on the raise hand button down at your screen, then the host will be able to um, grant you the, the, uh, the, the privilege to speak, then you can just speak out and everyone will be able to hear you as well. Um, but uh, just a housekeeping matter, when you raise a question, please kindly identify yourself as well as your affiliation so we know who um, we'll be talking to. So um, with that being said, we're waiting for the incoming questions. Um, while we're waiting for the incoming questions, I would like to raise uh, a few questions to our panelists, um, uh, just as we are waiting for the, the, the comments coming in. So in terms of, um, I, my, my questions are addressed to a specific panelists, but also um, other panelists, please feel free to chime in if you would like to. So to Zling and Matthias, both, both of you are, are based in China, so you definitely have more insights in, in, in China. I would like to ask a question relating to the new law on, on the solid pollution prevention and control. Um, we we realized that this new law has um, uh, a uh, very um, like innovative way of dealing with soil pollution, given that it first um, um, it for, uh, it's for the first time comparing to other um, laws on pollution, for example, the water law and, 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 and air pollution law is for the first time it, it addresses the problem of fund. Um, and the law says it's, it's a provincial fund, um, and, but what exactly are to be included in that fund? What are the sources for that fund? Um, do you have any insights to that? Or, um, and and are, are there any discussions in China regarding to that? And if, if not, if you could uh, recommend to the policymakers, to the legislatures, what would you propose to be included in that fund and how that fund could be structured? So those are the questions for you too. And also for Ingrid, um, if you like uh, later on to, to chime in, um, what are the, um, during your presentation, you did mention the, the experiences learned from those seven case studies um, around the world in terms of government um, um, involvement in uh, financing soil remediations, but um, are there any single one challenge that you found out from the study that is most uh, important that you see throughout those studies and how has the government been addressing that um, most important challenge? And in terms uh, a question for Ashani would be, um, yes, we know, uh, we, we heard from you that um, the design of the, the instruments are critical. And what do you think could help in the, in the design of those instruments in terms of the policy making and in terms of the coordination um, 
within the government, within the government and private sector, and how how do you um, suggest um, to move on from there? Thank you. Okay, now floors are open. We've unmuted all the panelists, so please feel free to to uh, to chime in. Um, maybe maybe Zling and Matthias, you would like to start. Okay, so for the question of the fund resources, I think uh, there's a uh, mainly three resources uh, for this fund. I think the first one is the uh, central government will uh, make uh, make some investments for this uh, to this fund. And the second part is we actually have the environmental tax uh, <coughs> uh, in this year and some of this money will be used for this fund to solve the soil pollution problems. And uh, I think the third uh, resources is from the revenues of the utilization of this land. You know, the, the land in China is pretty expensive, uh, especially in big cities. And uh, the, most of people are living in these this big cities. So, and this is a main market for the soil remediation project. So I think that is a high revenues. And if I recommend what we will put in, what's the source that we will use for the fund, I think we will uh, use some green uh, credits and uh, some financing ways to raise the money. Because I think it's really a complicated problem because this the, the money we need to solve the so soil pollution problems in China is pretty huge, and uh, only for only solely for these three resources, I think it's not enough. And actually, we uh, are still exploring what uh, funding channels we can use, and I think it's still a problem for us and. We were looking for the solutions now, and but I think uh, we 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 have these resources, and we should put more funding channels. And that's my answers. Thank you. Thank you, Zuli. Matthias. Do you have anything to add? Or uh, yeah, if I can, uh, yeah, if I can add a few things to that. First of all, I agree very much with the separation of uh, where the where the funds can come from in terms of sources. If we look at the idea of, uh, of establishing and using existing funds for soil remediation projects, you can also separate that into, into three categories. And so either it's designated soil remediation funds. This is so, something that is then suggested in the new um, policy document on soil remediation. As the second, we have now something like, as far as I counted last time, 256 local green funds where soil remediation is one of the ways that this money can be spent. Not necessarily, but it, it is in the catalog of how it can be spent. And it seems to be prioritized more and more. Um, so this is a trend that suggests that the existing green funds at local level will put more and more money into soil remediation. Uh, secondly, China is establishing uh, essentially a green fund where soil remediation will also be part of where the money can go into. Um, it remains to be seen how big this fund will be and uh, how it will be weighed in terms of other green priorities. But soil remediation is, should be definitely be one of them. This is the expectation. This is just some comment I can add on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matthias. So, um, uh, well, we did receive a question from, um, from a participant, but I would like to continue the discussion and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the question from the participants shortly. So Ingrid, please, um, the questions that I asked earlier in terms of 
from the international experience, what do you see as the um, the single the biggest challenge for for governments in financing solar mediations, and how has governments been dealing with that? Well, uh, I think the single one challenge uh, may be the limiting the risks associated with uh, remediation projects in order to attract the investors uh, in urban areas um, so that they don't um, limit themselves in their investments because of the risks. Um, this is both legal risks and regulatory risk, um, but also in more remote areas, I think there should be a good collaboration efforts between private and public sector in order to um, fund remediation projects. And that could be um, through public-private partnerships and also how to uh, implement, implement such uh, pro um, in instruments successfully. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, through our cases, we saw uh, several remediation funds, some of which were successful and some of which were not, or they were in the beginning and then government support ceased. So I, I think the, um, the, the limiting the risks and also uh, ensure continuity and uh, that they, uh, the investors and others could foresee what will happen. And that is the uh, economy is stable and also the regulations and Things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. So I, I think that ties nicely into my question to Ashani then, in terms of the, um, because this coordination that uh, uh, Ingrid just mentioned, and then the public private partnership that she mentioned. So, in terms of designing um, an instrument, that effectively designing an instrument, what do you see as the main? elements and the key elements in, in successful design such instruments? Uh, what I see perhaps comes from the new design of the European Soil Remediation Fund called JINCO2 that is covered both in uh, the international example report as, as well as in the innovation finance report in this series. Now JINCO2 um, which, is, which was designed in collaboration with a private investor, Rothschild, to be precise, embeds and incorporates a technical assistance center. And this center does the due diligence for the fund on the risk profile on the contamination, the characteristics of the contamination, and the cost of the remediation. Therefore, the fund internalizes the necessary due diligence on costs and risks. And in that way, perhaps the financing can be designed in a more efficient manner. And with the risks being internalized, the fund feels better equipped to bring in private investors and institutional investors who are extremely risk averse. Institutional investors holding our future and our children's future in their hands should not be investing in risk projects. We, there is no debate on that, I hope. So when we look at JINCO2, and I encourage our listeners and the readers of this report to, to dip into their website, you're going to see a list of rather unusual um, investors going into the fund, including a lot, uh, quite a few pension funds who haven't had the track record of investing in um, risky ventures like soil remediation. So Joe, 
To answer your question, what might be necessary is for public-private funds and public funds to begin to internalize these risks and begin deeper collaborations with associations like um, those on our consortium so that we understand better the risks. Money will then flow to where the returns are the most attractive. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now I'm um, turning to the question posed by one of our participants, uh, Botilde, I, I hope I pronounced her name right. Um, so I'm, I'm repeating the question here and I've asked Botilde to, to further elaborate the question just in case our panelists might have um, um, problem understanding the question. But the way that uh, the question is raised is that I am wondering who in the area of solar mediation are the relevant asset owners, asset managers, and financial, financial institutions. So which other stakeholders who have included financial risk and risks assessment would you identify? Um, I, I, I don't know who would like to take on, who from our panelists would like to take on this question, but uh, as a general matter, I think in terms of the case studies that we look at, We've all identified in each of the case studies. We did identify um, the the asset owners, managers, and financial institutions involved in those case studies. So I do invite everyone um, on this call to to further read the three reports that prepared by our experts, which you can um, easily find um, from from this. Um, there's a link. Uh, to those three reports embedded in the invitation that you received for this webinar. And also you can find it on ISD's website as well as our partner's website. Um, so, okay, so Boto further elaborate the question says, when assessing risks, dependency on longer term financial revenue flows relevant to social security, as well as direct and indirect impacts to other users and providers, I guess, um, this is asking who and what kind of risk um, assessment is being taken um, at uh, the, the the stage of determining um, or providing financial um, financing for social mediation. So, anyone from your studies have uh, looked into this uh, question and uh, any recommendations or any um, experience that uh, you gained from the studies? Please. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you for the question. Um, perhaps this question raises uh, the importance of understanding what will be the future use of the site after remediation and who will be the future users of the soil after remediation. Certainly in the categories that's been provided uh, by uh, a book held, a stakeholder you might want to add is the future users of the remediated soil. Uh, the challenge here arises because there's such a long lead time for the remediation activity. Uh, perhaps Ingwald will comment on this. It takes a very, very long time to actually remediate the soil. So when there's such a long time, it's sometimes difficult to envisage who exactly might be using the site, who exactly might be living in the houses being built in the site after remediation. What's really important is to simulate the revenues. And the revenues are linked to the design of and the fitness for purpose. So m m might I suggest that the attention should be there rather than who uses the site. Thank you. Thank you, Ashani. Um, any of our panelists would like to comment on this question or related area as well in terms of risk management? Um, Ingrid, you mentioned the importance of risk management from your studies. Do you want to uh, come in and comment as well? Yeah, well, I, I think that, uh, of course, you should do a um, thorough um, assessment of the risks. And also, we saw in some of our um, 
cases that the local uh, knowledge were very important for assessing the opportunities and the risks uh, associated with remediation, for instance, in the Fleckifjord case. Um, and also there's several um, investment banks or uh, development banks that has uh, undertaken some assessments uh, for risk in soil, soil remediation. So, um, and also when you create a fund, you gain a lot of experience, um, such as, uh, so that you can kind of uh, foresee what risks are um, possibly coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Ingo. Um, Matthias, well, you, you've been working on green bond for, for quite a while, and then also we know the green bond in China. Well, China has be become the, the world leading issuer for green bond, and, and in that um, context, uh, do you have any knowledge to share in terms of the risk management um, and, and the stakeholders involved um, in terms of uh, uh, assessing the financial risks when issuing those green bonds? Well, the main issue talking green bonds in China is that the market is still only a few years old. So while China might have the biggest green bond market in the world, the capital raised from issuing green bonds has not all been allocated. So actually we don't have the complete statistics today on what the capital will be used for. So I can't tell you very clearly how much goes into sort of mediation or how risks are managed uh, in, in that matter actually. We, we have to, uh, to wait at least till the end of this year to get all the information from, uh, from 2016. So this is basically the issue right now. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I see the time is approaching to our scheduled um, a closing time for this webinar. If we don't um, have any other burning questions from our participants, um, I would just like to invite our panelists, uh, each of our panelists, to, to close their um, discussion with a, with, with a, 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 a very short um, one sentence summary or uh, before we close the session. Um, let's let's start by uh, reversing order. Ashani, if one sentence or one key thing you would like to share, or one key message you'd like to share from the studies. The importance of public capital to be used as seed money or to or as a de-risking position in the financial structure of a project. Very, very important. That lends comfort for institutional investors, private investors, and even you and I as citizens to contribute uh, to soil remediation projects that are of particular interest to us. Thank you. Yes, I think there's uh, lots of lessons to be learned. And through these cases and also the um, form of political pace uh, principle, how you implement it in the legislation and also how you um, form the funds and other instruments, how you use credit enhancement to um, attract private capital. It, it's a lot to learn and um, Please read our report to to look more into that. Thank you, Zulay. Uh, I think uh, the soil remediation market in China is just uh, it's just emerging, and there's a lot of obstacle in ahead of us, and we need a lot of in, in innovative policies and uh, fundraising system to achieve our goals and still a long ways. That's my comment, I think. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, Matthias. Yeah, a final comment perhaps, just to uh, emphasize what Celine just said. 
that uh, as solar remediation financing is growing uh, in China, we see the same in the green financial system. So as green finance has expanded rapidly over the next years, when we expect to see the same over the coming few years, we also expect more and more support from the green financial system towards solar remediation projects. Well, thank you all. With that, um, we'd like to close uh, the session today. We thank you all for the panelists for the time as well as the participation from the participants.